Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to this Turnstile Tours virtual program. Um, we apologize for the technical glitch we had this morning with Zoom, um, but we're so grateful to have everyone here today. And we're looking forward to doing a tour of Ice Stone to learn about how they manufacture sustainable countertops using recycled glass and other types of recycled materials. Um, my name is Cindy Vandenbosch, and um, I'm, again, we're so grateful to everyone for their support. We are so excited that we will have the chance to visit a workplace that's inside the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, we're going live out to Ice Stone. And so, Ashan, if we can welcome you to the program, we'd love to um, have you join us at this time. Okay, can everybody hear me? We're good. Yeah, Ashad, it's great. It's great to see you. Um, and uh, we're, we're so pleased to have you on the program today. We're gonna have the chance to actually walk the factory floor with you at Ice Stone. Um, but if you could start by just sharing a little bit about yourself and your role at Ice Stone and what brought you to work there. Yes, um, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Ashad McCollin, as Cindy has said. I am the my title is the Director of Marketing and Communications at ISO. I've um, been here for four years now. Febru actually, February 14th will be exactly four years. And um, what brought me here was um, I am a, a Brooklyn native, um, born and raised in Brooklyn. And um, when I was you know, looking for a new opportunity, um, I saw ISO Stone and um, did some research. I saw what the company was about and it piqued my interest. And um, that's what got me to apply and also, you know, most of my career, I you know worked in Manhattan, so being able to work in Brooklyn was a, a relief. Made my my commute a lot more shorter, so that's always good as well. Um, and yeah, so that um, that's what brought me here at Ice Stone. And Ice Stone, what can you give for people who may not be familiar with Ice Stone? Could you tell us about um, how the company got started? What the what the backstory is? Right. So um, first of all, uh, let me explain what Ice Stone is. We are um, uh, a countertop manufacturer. Um, our product is made from recycled glass, cement, and non-toxic pigment. And um, besides counter, it's mostly used for countertops, like probably about 80, 90% of our sales is for countertops, but it can also be used for bath and vanities um, and also customizable pieces like a desktop or a tabletop um, and things like that. Like for example, all of our desks and our work in our office, they're all um, made from high stone. So um, yeah, so it could be used for a variety of different things as well. And um, it's made from recycled glass and cement and non-toxic pigment. And the way we got started, um, it's an interesting story. So I still have been around since 2003 and we've always been here in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And the way it started was it was a previous company called Great Harbor. And they also produced the same material that we did, but they never were able to put it out um, for, and co for commercial use to the public because they could never get the formula correct. So they use the same type of material, recycled glass, uh, cement, and, and pigment, non-toxic pigment, but they just couldn't get it correct because um, you know, cement kept cracking, they kept having issues with the material. So eventually um, the company went up for auction and the founders of Ice Stone, uh, Peter Strugatz and Mariana Mariani, um, they, bought the, they bought the company, um, Great Harbor, from the auction, uh, rebranded it, renamed it Ice Stone, and um, spent time um, developing um, the product, um, getting cement experts to come up with the right formula to finally uh, come up with the product that we see today. And also I'd like to mention, um, besides the founders, some of our um, early investors in the company were a few well-known names like um, Ben Cohen from Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream. He was an early investor. Um, our main investor, Dal Lamania, who's our chairman, um, he was the founder of Tweezer Man. He was, um, uh, he's our main, he was our main investor. He was an investor as well. Um, the founder of Odwala um, Drinks, I forgot his name, but he's the founder of Odwala. Um, he's also an investor and um, a couple other people, but those are some notable names that you might know of. Um, also, I'd like to mention uh, some of our popular installations where you might have seen. Oh, oh, okay. So let me pull up. I know we have some photos here in the background um, to share some of these, some of these projects that you've done. So uh, mm -hmm. I'll pull these up here so people can... Uh, follow along and see them. Yeah, so this picture right here is, um, this is um, our R&D area. 
And all those different colors you see are um, custom colors um, that we've made over the years. So if you can see that that nice blue color there, that was um, Tiffany. That's Tiffany blue. That was a custom color we did for Tiffany's. Um, it was it was made to be like a display, a base for one of their displays, and um, we made that for Tiffany's. And um, we're gonna get another one up here for you in just a second. And those yeah, those stools right there, those were. Um, custom colors made for Starbucks. Um, so they, we did a couple of Starbucks locations for their counters and, and this particular image here, those are um, some bar stools. And this is a color, um, one of our colors called Cobalt Ice. This is for, uh, this is the bathroom of NASA's headquarters. Uh, we did their bathroom vanities and we also did their kitchens as well, the kitchen countertops. So that's NASA you see right there, their headquarters. And this one, is from, um, I don't know if you guys remember the show MTV Real World. So this was uh, one of their seasons when they were in Brooklyn. Um, it was about 10, 2010, I think. Uh, whatever the last season was when they were in Brooklyn, <laughs> this, this was, um, this was the, the Real World house. Uh, and this is this color, that color you see there is uh, Sapphire Snow. So can you tell us um, a little bit about, you know, in terms of the founding of the company, you mentioned Ben and Jerry's. Um, mm -hmm. iStone was one of the first certified B corporations, as I understand it, and was even a founding member of certified B Corps. Could you talk a little bit uh, about what, what that involved and what makes iStone a certified B corporation? Right. So um, being a B corporation, um, it's a very rigorous process. And um, Turnstile out Tours is also a fellow B Corp member as well. Yeah. Um, and we are a founding member it basically means that we were one of the first 50 members of, of B Corporation and what B Corporations are, they're for profit companies that have, a, um, they focus a lot of their business on social and environmental um, impact and, um, and, com and community impact as well, and um, focus on business practices that are, you know, have a high standard. So the, the way we fall into that as far as ice stone is um, first of all, our product made from recycled glass, 100% um, recycled glass. And um, we're about a 90% zero waste uh, energy facility. So things in our production process, we have a recycling water system. We use steam powered kilns from the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, we go through a rigorous testing to get different certifications for our materials. So all of those factors to make our product as sustainable and eco-friendly as possible um, is one of the reasons why we're a B Corp. Um, another reason is um, um, our employees, uh, we have uh, our employees earn a living wage. Um, we tend to hire, you know, people. Um, we, had, we had a lot of Tibetan um, employees at one time. Um, and uh, yeah, so our employees earn a living wage immediately upon hire. They get benef um, benefits immediately upon hire. So um, that also plays a factor in, into us being a B Corp as well. And then our environmental factor as well, being a zero waste, 90% uh, zero waste facility, working on trying to be 100%. And speaking of um, employees, we see that um, you have a new employee, Anthony Weiner, um, mm -hmm. is your new uh, president and CEO, is that right? The CEO, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and so how many, um, and, and how many like employees then do you guys uh, currently have, or do you typically have? We're, um, we're a very small company. Um, we kind of almost operate in a sense of like a startup. We have that type of mind frame. Um, so the employees we have, we have about, uh, around, around 12 to 15, I would say half of them, half in the office and half works in the factory. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, and um, and so there are some questions that are popping up um, that have to do with um, what kind of glass do you use. Um, we are going to get to go out on the factory floor and kind of see that. Um, but you know, does Ice Stone just recycle any type of glass, or are there particular kinds of glass? Ronan wants to know. And then also, like, how do you sort the glass by color? How does this work? Right. Yeah. So um, the glass we get, it's not the recycled glass that's from uh, residential um, houses. That's, you know, that's from the garbage. Um, you get what we call uh, pre-consumer recycled glass or post-industrial recycled glass, either or either term works. And basically what that is, is we get our glass from uh, commercial recyclers. So any company that makes uh, glass, whether it's um, car manufacturers that make, you know, windshield, auto glass um, and bottle companies like Coca-Cola, Budweiser, all the, any type of company that makes and produces glass, you know, they have 
um, defective glass in their process that they don't use or um, extra surp extra glass in their surplus that they don't use. And so instead of wasting that glass and throwing it out, what they do is they sell it to commercial recyclers. And that's where we get our glass and we get our glass from these commercial recyclers. And what they do is they crush up the glass for us. Uh, they sand it so that the edges are not sharp and then they sell it to us. And so that's where we get our glass from. That's, it's so interesting. So, so for example, what would be some examples of different kinds of companies that might dispose of glass in their manufacturing process that would eventually get processed and come to you? Yeah, so um, our brown glass, um, some of our brown glass comes from Budweiser bottles. Um, the green glass comes from Heineken. We get um, a lot of glass from like car, um, car uh, manufacturers. Um, I don't know the particular brand, probably all of them. And then um, also our, our blue, also our blue glass. Um, some of that comes from uh, Sky Vodka bottles as well. And then some of our other glass. Um, some of our glass is also dyed, um, like the red glass, the orange glass, because um, you know there's hardly anywhere where you would find that accurate glass. So some of our glass, um, is, it gets dyed to get that color as well. And we have a, a photo here of some of the green glass up close. We'll be able to see this out on the factory floor as well. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, this is sort of where where the process kind of starts for you. Um, and then you have uh, 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 what goes into the countertops besides the recycled glass typically. Right, so what you see here um, is the glass. And uh, I might add also that our glass, we have different sizes. So some are very sand-like, um, like fine sand-like and some are very thick. So what you see here is like the different sizes of glass. And then the image you see on the far left at the bottom um, is that's the, uh, the non-toxic pigment. So all of the other items there are glass, just different sizes and thicknesses. And then the last, and then the, the, the um, that image on there is the, is the pigment that's the third from the, the first, well, the first from the right. Yeah. And, and we'll see this, you know, so here you can see this whole variety <laughs> of, um, of different kinds of, of colors of countertops and mm -hmm. samples. Um, and it arrives really in these huge bags. So it's already been, it's already been processed. It's already prepared by the time it arrives at the factory. Exactly. So we don't, only thing we have to do once it arrives is just test it to make sure it's up to our standards and make sure it's clean and everything. And, um, oh, might I add, speaking of clean, um, Remember, if you guys remember Hurricane Sandy in 2012, this is a big story for us about redemption um, and surviving. Um, Hurricane Sandy flooded our factory. It was about five feet of water that came into our factory. And um, they were ready, the owners were ready to, to shut the business down and close it and, and get rid of it. And our employees, being the loyal people that they are, um, to see, you know, we're good to them. So they, in turn, they're good to us. So what they did was once they got the water out, they inspected the machines, um, inspected the glass, and they convinced the, the owners that um, they can fix this. And so what we did was we got um, an SBA loan, and um, we used that loan to uh, shut the company down for about seven, eight months or so, but our workers would still come to work every day, and we would use that loan to pay them. Um, so they would come to work every day, um, same regular time and schedule and everything, and they spent like the six, seven, eight months of uh, fixing up the machines, um, getting new parts if necessary, cleaning, thoroughly cleaning the glass. So we was able to save all the glass that got uh, contaminated. They were able to clean it and test it and it came out fine. And um, after about seven or eight months, we were able to say that well, we're back in business. Um, so that's a huge story for us. If you Google it, you'll find it everywhere. New York Times, CNN, everywhere. Yeah, and I mean, I think it goes back to the B Corp thing where your employees in fact own a percentage of the company. Um, right. which makes a real difference, right? There's that um, mm -hmm. financial incentive, which I know we're all thinking about how can we create a more equitable world? And, uh, and this model of certified B corporations is one way where if there's employee ownership or, you know, that, that makes a big difference. Right. Um, just so people have a sense, since you brought up Hurricane Sandy, why don't we show where you're located um, and its orientation within the Brooklyn Navy Yard and where it is, um, you know, in proximity to the waterfront and to Wallabout Bay. Um, so this here is a is a map of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, and this uh, red this this orange line that goes around the outside is the wall outside the Navy Yard. Um, Ice Stone is over. Um, near the Sand Street entrance, um, the side of the yard that's closest to the neighborhood of Vinegar Hill and Dumbo. 
um, and the Farragut houses, um, which are just outside uh, the gate. So if you were to enter right here and pass Kings County Distillery, you guys are over here in this building just to the left. And I should mention that if you, speaking of Hurricane Sandy, you look at maps of the Brooklyn Navy Yard um, today, and then going back to hundreds of years ago before we the Navy Yard was even there, um, you see that much of the Navy Yard is built upon landfill, including where you are, which was historically marshland. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you were in a place uh, within the yard that was disproportionately um, affected, certainly by the flooding that happened uh, during Superstorm Sandy. Um, and I'll just show one other image to give people orientation. This here is um, Flushing Avenue in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and your building is just over here, um, just so people People have a sense and an idea, and it's a building that dates back to the 19th century. Um, but it has great lighting, which is a positive. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> so, so Ashan, um, you the highlight is really taking us down on the factory floor, but you are in the showroom where, if people wanted to um, see different samples of your countertops, this is where they would start their tour, mm -hmm. so to speak. So can we see some of the end products there? Can you take us around with your phone? Absolutely. And we're gonna go ahead and spotlight you so that um, we can really see inside your space. Okay. So I'm just showing you our color palette right now. We have about, we have 17 colors. Um, there's one missing from here, which is one of our newer colors, but these are all of our colors. Move a little closer if you need to see. And some of your countertops um, don't just use uh, glass, but you also incorporate in some cases uh, types of shells. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I'll show a little closer here, like white pearl. These two right here have uh, oyster shells. It's white pearl and sky pearl. Judy is complimenting I uh, complimenting you on the lovely colors of the countertops. Uh, thank you. This color here, you see sage pearl. This was installed in um, Heineken headquarters. And we, I have a picture here in our showroom. I'll show you that in a minute as well. And this color here is special Gotham Gray because it's the only one that contains mirror. See the little sparkly mirrors there. Yeah. And, and is so it these are our... Oh, sorry. Mm-hmm. Is it, is it true that um, you guys recycle, uh, use about a million pounds of recycled glass every year? Yes. Um, yeah, so to, to date, we've uh, saved about 17 million uh, tons of glass from being uh, uh, dumped in landfills. Wow, that's incredible. And, and I mean, can you tell us, uh, just for folks that maybe don't understand why this is such an important business model, why are these countertops so so much more environmentally and socially responsible than let's say um, the process that it takes to make your traditional kind of countertop or granite countertop for example right because um grant other countertop materials like granite marble and quartz they're very bad for the environment um like hugely hugely bad and um what makes ice ice stone safer and better is um the, because it doesn't uh See, the thing is like these, I'm gonna, hold on, let me, I'm gonna switch to my face real quick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing with, um, especially like quartz, they have this thing called um, silica, uh, crystalline silica. There's two types of silica, crystalline and um, amorphous, amorphous silica. And crystalline, crystalline silica is the one that's really bad. Amorphous silica is found everywhere. It's in, it's in glass and sand in the beach and everything. Um, but crystalline silica is the one that's harmful uh, to a lot of people. That's um, there was a lot of articles or earlier, late last year, talking about the the um, the, the crystalline silica and how it causes people to get uh, lung cancer and there's another lung disease. I forgot the name of it, but um, the people that work with these materials like quartz and granite and stuff you know, they're susceptible to getting these type of diseases because of the dust that's in the air. There is a way to avoid it is, um, all you have to do is just use water, like when you're cutting the material. But I know a lot of fabricators, um, fabricators, by the way, they're the ones that do the cutting and installation of the countertop. A lot of them don't like to use water when, when they're doing their cutting because um, for some reason it, um, it just it interrupts their, like cutting, cutting it without the water 
it, it kind of makes the process go faster and cleaner, I guess. So a lot of them try tend to not use water when they're doing their cutting and stuff. Um, so it is, it can be, you know, the silica can be avoided. But the thing is with ice stone, since it's made from um, glass, 75% glass, um, it's amorphous silica, which is the less harmful type and um, makes it much more cleaner and safer to work with. Yeah, yeah, that's great. We have a few, we have several questions actually. Sure. Um, while, while you're stationary. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Ronan is wondering, wondering if there are other recycled glass companies like ice stone in New York City. Not based in New York City. Um, there is one in uh, Georgia, I believe, called Betrazo, and they're even much more expensive than us. Uh, oh, by the way, anybody thinking of how much we cost pricing, we're um, comparable to, uh, we're a little less expensive than marble. We're um, a little bit higher than granite, but less expensive than marble. So we are considered a luxury product, um, just so people have an idea how much it costs. But um, yeah, there's one company in Georgia uh, called Betrazo. Um, the difference between them and us is they use, um, resin in their material and then they use a like a larger larger piece of glass right right and yeah. uh, judy is just mentioning in response to the um safety conditions in terms of producing countertops that she'd heard that um the sort of traditional types of countertops um are, are more it's a more dangerous kind of uh working situation obviously you're also um extracting natural resources whereas this is a recycled uh, mostly recycled glass and um, recycled shells and things like that. Um, there's right. also a question about whether you use uh, oyster shells in any of your any of your countertops. Are those? Yes, the uh, the um the shells. I just uh, the pictures I just showed you have uh, the oyster shells in them. We have about five of our colors have oyster shells in them. Okay. Okay. Great. And then you also have partnerships with other. So you, on one hand, produce in your factory ice stone, but um, you also sell some other products that come in at different price points. Could you show those to us? Those are in the showroom as well, and and tell us the story Absolutely. behind them. Mm -hmm. And then we'll make our way down into the factory. Um, yes, folks. At yesterday we tested this out, and the Wi-Fi was great. So we're hoping the same will be true today. So this, these uh, materials you see here is paper stone. This is made from recycled paper. And these are all of the colors in their palette. Being that it's made from paper, you know, it's very, they don't have um, as much colorful options. And where are these manufactured? They are based out of in Washington state, so all the way on the West Coast. So that is paper stone. And over here, I know I just mentioned the dangers of quartz, but for us to be uh, to be competitive in the market, we, um, you know, even a lot of people love quartz because it's so cheap. Um, but the difference is with our quartz, which is called quartz stone, is that we use, um, first of all, it's made from Italy, from Italian, um, it's Italian. And um, it's used, uh, they use a process called the Breton process, which is the safest way uh, to manufacture quartz. Um, it has a low environmental impact. So, you know, we try to be as eco-friendly and sustainable as possible. And we have these, we, we, we make these, we um, distribute and partner up with these other companies just to be competitive in the market in case anybody wants something um, besides ice stone or something a little less expensive. Although paper stone can be almost just as expensive depending on the size and thickness because it ranges in a variety of thicknesses. And um, I'm just to show you some of our awards we have here. Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce member, okay. best for New York. You see a B Corp, B Corp marketing award here. Another B Corp Be the Change award. This is, I don't know if you can see, this is Dal Amanya, our CEO, former CEO. He's still our chairman. Cool. Um, so there's a question here and then maybe we can go for a uh, tour down into the space. Oh, I see the ice stone samples here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so there's a question here about durability. Marilyn wonders how durable are the ice stone countertops compared to, let's say, uh, quartz or marble? We're just as durable, We're just as durable. Um, so I, I think the real highlight, we're going to now make our way down um, into the factory, but everybody, please keep your questions coming. Let me show um, um, real quick, show some quick uh, installations here in our showroom so people can get a sense of what ice stone looks like installed. So here is um, our desk in our showroom. This is the color of this one is our white pearl color. And then over here, this is the old color, but I just want you to see how like you can use ice stone for custom pieces. This is a bench. 
and they use the piece of ice stone to put in the middle of it. And then also here, this is an old color as well, but this, you can see this is used as a windowsill. And over here, we had a creative person make a lamp out of ice stone. And then sitting right below it is uh, another piece of ice stone. It's like a little, you know, little end table, I guess. Yeah, we, and, uh, we also, we've been using um, ice stone as our, our paperweights at Turnstile Tours office. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Because you have yes. business card holders too. Yes, uh, don't, do we have, uh, we don't have any up here, no. Um, so great. So let's we'll, let's make our way, uh, if we can, down into the factory. Uh, Judy mm -hmm. loves the desk. She thinks it's gorgeous. Um, and I'm just, while you're walking, I know it can be a little disorienting. So I'm going to spotlight my myself along with you uh, so that people have some visual grounding. Uh, and then once we get down into the factory floor, we'll... we'll um, so where, where are you going to take, take us first, Ashan? I'm going to, I'm going to take you, um, and I have my mask on in case I sound muffled. Um, I'm going to take you, I'm going to show you the step-by-step -step process of how we make it. So I'm, I'm going to take you step-by-step, -step, um, to show you how we actually make it. So right now we're down in the factory. So all of these white sacks, this is our glass. And is it possible for us to look into one of the bags? Yes, I'll show you a few of them, actually. This is our amber glass. This is our mirror. Oh. Um, here's some uh, green, emerald green glass. And it's more, you can see this one is more finer, almost sand-like. And Howard is wondering, uh, the glass is straight from a supplier. So again, there, there is a company that processes, they receive the uh, glass that companies are going to dispose of, and then they process it and grind it up into whatever size glass you need, is that right? That's right, so the way you see it is how we get it. All we do is just test it, um, just to make sure it's up to our standards. And where is the company, do you know where the company is based that um, produces? We have two, uh -huh. two suppliers. Um, one is in, I wanna say Illinois, I believe, and the other is in Utah, I think. Mm -hmm. So, Moving on to the next step. This is the uh, batching process. So this is where we begin mixing the rest of the ingredients together. So these sacks up here that you see is where we pour the glass. And we have a, for we have a formula um, test that, te uh, that we've done through research and everything to uh, you know where we know the certain amount of percentage of glass to put in our material. So we, um, we have somebody just operate the computer and uh, you know, puts the formula in the computer and then the glass, that percentage of glass will fall down into this tube and it will go all the way to the end of the machine. And we should note that you have, we've done tours with you live. Uh, guys, uh, the same tour we're mm -hmm. doing today, essentially. <laughs> I think. I think our guys are on lunch. That's why it's so quiet down here, if anybody's wondering, which is a good thing. So then you can hear me clearer. <laughs> um, so then there, so the glass will go all the way up to the top, to top, um, the top of that mixer there. And this little container right here, that's where we would pour the cement and we would bring that up as well. And so we would pour the cement and then um, pour the pigment if it's needed in there as well and mix it all up for about five minutes or so to get the air bubbles out and to make sure the mix is good. And after that, it would fall down here. And we would have um, a tray 
we have a tray usually um, underneath where the um, the mixture would um, pour down. And actually, Cindy, if you want, you could pull up that picture where they can actually see how it looks like. like yeah, sure. Down. So before you move to the next space, let me pull that up so everybody can see it. So this is what it this is what it would look like, um, and then you can see, kind of here. This is zoomed out a bit, but you see the worker, and you can see uh, that it's going down into this tray. So these are the the two photos we have of this part of the process. Mm -hmm. So then we bring the tray over here to our vibrating table, and the vibrating table is just to get the air bubbles out um, of the mixture to make the thing is uh, you know smooth and. Air. So the glass and our process, the glass has to be uh, face down. So the vibrating table also shakes the glass to the bottom of the um, the bottom of the molding tray. And then the next step, you take it to the kilns. You can see our trays here. And this, the kiln is basically like a big, large oven, basically. It's to cure the material, to harden it up, and it's, um, Steam powered. We use steam here from the Navy, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and uh, we keep it here for about twelve to sixteen hours. Yeah, I should I should note that the the Brooklyn yeah, Navy Yard, the Navy Yard has its own um, power plant that produces steam, um, and that, that there's a whole that produces a lot of the steam that's actually sent in pipes under the East River and used for Manhattan steam system. Um, but some of that steam stays inside the Brooklyn Navy Yard and is used by different com companies and also of course used for um, the heating system and other purposes. And so this is a, you use it for the, the kiln um, for treating the countertops, which I, I think is really interesting. And the, mm -hmm. the, the lighting in your space is so good okay. and it's mostly just natural lighting. Yes, we mostly use natural light. Um, yeah, so yeah, so it's, it's, I mean, the lighting is excellent in here. So moving on to the next step, after we take it, after we take it out the kiln, we bring it to this machine over here called the calibr calibrating machine. This uh, these suction cups right here lifts lifts it up from the tray. And it rolls into the machine. And so, what and what is what is happening here in this stage? So, in this process, this is just to make sure that all of our um, slabs are the same thickness. So, this machine just kind of uh, shaves off or sands off, um, you know, just a few centimeters or so um, of the material, just to make sure that it's even and it's all the same thickness. It takes and about seven minutes to go through this machine. You can see that and there. still at, at this point it's still face down. So you're just trying to get a uniform size at this point or thickness. Right. Um, we have a we have a question that's um, a couple of different questions here. So if you want to take a take a break in this process so we can answer these. Um, Ronan is curious about whether there are certain types of glass that don't melt. Like, can you go over the composition of each component again and do temperatures melted vary depending on the piece being created? So essentially, like, it's, is there a control room where somebody is determining what the temperature should be depending on which kind of mix you have and what, what type of glass and other aggregate is included? Um, as far as like, you know, the, the batching process, as far as like the temperature during that process or just, yeah. the, 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 um, not that I know there's, um, but we do, we do, um, do a fire test for our glass. So, um, I forgot, I forgot what the rating is. Um, but, uh, in our actual production process is, um, no, there's no, uh, testing or anything as far as, um, testing the, uh, the glass, as far as the melting. And does, anything. does the glass, does it melt when it's in the kiln? Is it, does it, is the temperature high enough in the kiln that the glass pieces actually melt? 
No, they don't. Um, actually, the, the 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 um, I think it's about it's very low. Actually, it's like about around hundred and fifty degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. It's very low, actually. That's why um, it stays in there for like several hours. Okay. Okay. So um, continuing, we do have a question about installation, but we're gonna get to that a little bit later, Joyce, um, once we sort of complete the process. Um, mm -hmm. So where, where are we at? What, is, what are we looking at here? Okay, so after this calibration process where they shave it down um, to make sure it's even and the same thickness, we set it to the side, like in this area here um, or over here. And basically this is where we have to let it um, air dry and air cure for about two weeks or so. So the kiln, speeds up the process. It um, takes about 12 to 16 hours to do that process, but then we have to do it again. But this time we have to do it naturally and just let it air dry and air cure. And all of this is from um, from our cement experts. This is this is what makes the material durable. Um, Cause you know, cement um, is susceptible to uh, breaking and cracking and things like that. So the, the way we produce our material is so that it doesn't do that. So moving on to the next step. This is our polishing machine. So after about two weeks or so, we take the slab and we bring it here to our polisher, which is, that's exactly what it does. It polishes the material to give it the shine. And I'm just gonna work to the other end on the side here. And it would be nice if you could see it like when it's actually coming out and when the light hits it, like it looks so shiny, especially the, the, the materials with the, uh, with the um, oyster shells and the like you can see them just sparkle, you know. So yeah, that's our uh, polishing machine. It takes about 10, 10 to 15 minutes to go through here. And then go to our final step, which is where we apply our sealer. Um, this is something new we've done to ice we've done it to ice on for the past in the past year we've, we've applied a new permanent treatment so before the thing with um countertops with cement in them is porous meaning you know meaning like liquid could go through and stain the material and stuff so we used to have to recommend um for the owners that they would have to to keep up the maintenance they would have to seal it yearly um just using any commercial sealer would work um but you know, that kind of, you know, people kind of get aggravated having to maintain a kind of top, you know, so what we did was come up with a formula, a permanent treatment where we seal it here in our factory. And so then once it ships out, it never has to be sealed again. So oh. it's going is even lower maintenance um, and it makes it even more durable and more heat and stain resistant. And um, most importantly of all, you don't have to, the, the customer doesn't have to slit anymore. Uh, Sean, I have a photo. So I have a photo of um, the process of sealing here that I thought I'd share with one of your staff members so people mm -hmm. can see. Um, and so this is, this is also the point at which your, um, you, your staff check over and make sure that there aren't any, any blemishes uh, or... Yeah, any blemish, blemishes or pinholes, yes, they check that as well. Um, and, and, and the sealer would fill that up as well. So we have several questions from the audience that I wanted mm -hmm. to be sure to have, uh, to get in. Um, I don't know if you want to turn your, your camera around so we can see you. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> Okay, great. So um, some of the questions that we have here um, are, uh, when is, do custom colors come from different glass colors or do you just use the colors that you have? And um, for the dyes, what kinds of non-toxic dyes do you use if you know? Um, the non-toxic dyes, I don't know exactly um, what it is. But uh, as far as the custom colors, um, it can range. Um, usually we have the glass for that. It just depends on the size. But they want the, the main thing with the custom colors, pigment, color, um, a lot of research and development, um, getting that right exact color that the customer wants. But I also might add, because it's so time consuming and, and, and 
Oop, we Ashan. normally do custom colors anymore unless it has to be a like a very large project. Uh huh. Oh, I was just gonna say you might need to move uh, move a little bit uh, closer to the middle of the space um, for us to get a better connection. Um, so you were saying with the custom colors, um, because it is such a time intensive process to get it right, that is something you do, but it would need to be a large, a really big right. Order, right? <laughs> right, right. Okay, exactly. the connection is much better now. This is great. Um, Judy okay. wants to know, do you make all items for specific orders? So um, is each is each order customized or do you have standard standard uh, we, all have, we all have um our standard our standard colors um the thing is though we do produce like more of our more popular colors we do produce more of those to have in stock because you know they're popular and we're probably going to get orders for them but um and some of our like less popular colors maybe like the like the, the, Tus the tuscan sunset or the moroccan red we kind of make those to or make those to order and do do the counters? Uh, Marilyn wants to know if the the, the counter the counters. Um, oh, Judy said, "Yep, that's what I meant." Great. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, Marilyn wonders: Do the counters crack easily, and does the firing process make the counters less glass-like? No, um, doesn't crack is We used to have a cracking problem like many years ago, but we've solved that. We solved that, and um, so yeah, it doesn't uh, it doesn't crack. In some instances, it does. Like that's, that's usually. When it travels long distances, but um, as I mentioned, um, that new that new uh, treatment that we added to it that makes it um even more durable than before. So there's really hardly any cracking issues anymore. And may I, may I ask um how how has Ice Stone needed to adapt during the pandemic in terms of the health and safety of your staff and mm -hmm. your production process? How have you been affected by the pandemic? Well, the thing is um. We will take we take our precaution. We um, every day we have our guys um, wipe wipe down everything and clean everything every every single day. And um, the thing is, like every area is so spaced out, um, and you only need like one one or two people to operate um, a machine at a time, and they're kind of spread apart. They're kind of spread apart anyway. So as far as the distance factor, um, that didn't affect us at all because we were already working from a distance anyway. Um, and then over here, like upon entry, we have our thermometer, um, a, a, a thermometer for people to check their temperature and they have to sign in with their, um, and write down the temperature that they have, um, you know, just to make sure nobody has a fever or anything like that. So they have to do that. Everybody has to do that once they come in. And um, so, yeah, that's basically, that's basically how we've adapted um, to the COVID. And then the office, we're all spread out as well. Um, and we was already, we already were. And um, anybody that is like somewhat close, we have like part glass partitions to separate us. And um, I, I know that you recycle a lot of the water that you use in your production process. Mm -hmm. um, how does that work? Um, okay, let me show, I'll show you that actually. So back to the, in the calibration process, this is where we use the most water. And I can see here, this is the drain. This is where the water goes down. And then it goes back into our, I'll show you our recycling water tank. So it's this big tank right here and uh, filters out the dirt and the debris. And, um, and then we're able to use, reuse the clean water again. And that right there is the control tower, right? In the center of the mm -hmm. space? Yeah. And so this is where sort of the, all of the mechanics of the batching occur? Yeah, the yeah, the batching, the, um, what I mentioned in the first, the, the, the second step with the, or, the orange little things over there, that's, that's what the control, control room is mostly used for. It's a uh, computer, I use the computer, um, you know, to make sure the glass, the, the right amount of glass falls down into, the, into the, the machine. And we have a question here about different size molds. Do you have just one size mold? Um, mm -hmm. so how, do, yeah. how does the sizing of the countertops work? Yeah, it's just one size mold right now, um, which is 52 and a half by 96 and a half inches. And it's a, a inch and a quarter thick. 
Uh, and Alan wonders how many pieces can you complete in a day? Um, I don't know the maximum amount, but we usually, the most that we usually do is about, um, what is it? Is it 16 or 24? I think it's 20, 24. We do, we usually, the, the amount that we do, which is standard for us is 24, but I believe like we could do more than that if we wanted to. Yeah. And then of course it, it, it took weeks for it to be ready because you have the resting process mm -hmm. um, kind of in the middle. So from beginning to finish, how long from the second you get the glass, you know, from you start mixing the glass with the cements from that point all the way to when it's ready to go out to the customer, what's the window of time to produce about a cup four, and have it four, ready? About, about four weeks. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, so Stefan is um, saying, when I think of manufacturing, this is what I imagine. And he says that it's great <laughs> to see that it's happening in Brooklyn. Right, um, yeah. Yeah, and it is, it is, it's, 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 it's neat to see uh, a company like yours that's manufacturing, creating like good jobs, has a, a profit share um, with the staff and that's doing something that's good for the environment. Um, it's a, a real pleasure to have you here today and, and thank you so much for sharing your story. If anybody um, wants to learn more or is maybe in the market for countertops or <laughs> wants a durable surface for another purpose, how might they get in touch with you or with the company? Um, they can contact us Contact us on um, icestoneusa.com and um, we have a contact form on there, um, you know, fill it out and, um, you know, just let, us, just let us know what you need and we'll be able to help you. Oh, that's great. That's great. Thank, thanks so much. And um, Howard is saying that he used to love going on factory tours when he was in banking uh, to see stuff actually being made. And mm -hmm. uh, we should say that, um, who knows, we'll see in the future. But historically, we have been able to do inside industry tours that explore Ice Stone Live uh, and would love to do that with the folks who are watching um, when that's safe and it's possible um, right. in the future. Right. Um, so uh, if anybody has any other questions, now would be the time. Otherwise, uh, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today. Um, both you, Ashan, for sharing your knowledge and experience at Ice Stone uh, and taking us on this tour to learn more about uh, your production process and the products that you guys make and just the story of the business. Um, and oh, there's a, a question. Uh, there is another question here. Does the Navy Yard offer reduced rent since this, since this is such a large space um, with so many machines? Um, I think it's more that the businesses that have uh, that are 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 there for a long time, like you guys mm -hmm. have been there for decades, um, and so you get, I would guess, longer term. I, I would right. guess. I don't know. Yeah. But no, you're exactly you're exactly right. Yes. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a more like a longer term agreement, and then obviously the mission of the Navy Yard is to create good paying um, jobs, and especially in the manufacturing sector. And so you would certainly fall into that category. And um, I still also works with other businesses uh, that are inside right. the yard. Right. I, I, I was gonna I was gonna add that um, since this place is so huge and we have like extra space, we do rent out our spaces to um other small businesses so we have like artists here that have like a whole a studio to themselves to do their design work and everything we have um a, we have another a jewelry maker in here we have um another we have a, a fellow fabricator in here um you know fabricators are the one that do the cutting and installation so we partner with them a lot um so it's like basically if you're here in new york city um, or even the tri-state area and you want a countertop from us it's, it's basically like a one-stop shop you can get the material from us and you can get the fabricator right here to do the cutting and installation for you um, you can get it all done in one place so um that's another way you know we try to try to uh, be a zero waste uh company you know we try to fill up the areas the spaces that we don't use and have give um you know rent it out to people that have businesses yeah, and actually that 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 answers Joyce's question from earlier where she was asking about whether we do the installation at the customer site or whether someone else does the installation. Yeah, someone else does the installation. So we're we're basically like a wholesaler. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, Ronan wants to know does it become really dusty when the countertops are being made in the space and how do you handle um, the dust? 
No, um, the reason it doesn't is because um, you have to use the water that prevents like the dust from coming into the air. So that's a water water prevents all of that. But if it wasn't, if you don't use water, then yeah, it would get really dusty. It doesn't, it, and I know because I've been in there. It really doesn't get very dusty at all in in the space um, during the production process. Yeah, it's a lot of people say like we're one of the cleanest warehouses that they've ever seen. Warehouse, I mean factories, warehouses. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, great. Well, I think, oh, there's another question. What's the mold made out of? Um, the, the actual tray, um, I do not know. Maybe steel, I I'm, but I'm not exactly 100% sure. Right, it's a big metal tray. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and um, we wish you and your fellow staff members uh, health and safety during this time. Um, and we appreciate that that you took the time to share um, your story with us today in the space. Oh, one more question. Ramona wants mm -hmm. to know, what do you do with your scraps? That's one thing we would like to um, learn more of, of where to um, use our scraps. They can be used for like road beds, um, crushed up and used for road beds. We also give them to um, artists like sculptors and people that want to use um, um, our leftover scraps um, for like art projects and things like that. And also a lot of students take our scraps as well for, um, to work on projects as well. But um, we're always looking for more ways um, to get rid of it as well. That's, yeah, one, that's I mean, one of our challenges. Yeah, that's, that's, I know that you have different environmental certifications where you're really thinking about cradle to cradle and you're thinking about the, the whole kind of cycle and zero waste. Uh, and, and you've gotten many, many awards for that and are always kind of seeking to improve. And part of that mission is also education um, with the public, which includes tours like this and also school programs with students. Right. Um, so um, th thank you for, for making the time. And um, we're going to sign off now, but hopefully folks will join us again tomorrow. We'll be uh, going live with uh, Stefan and Andrew, who are our team members who will be discussing. We're going to be doing a historical program um, looking at the history of uh, steamships. Um, and steam ferries, steam powered ferries. Uh, so different, different kind of focus tomorrow, but steam is also in the mix today. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so Ashan, uh, have a great day and uh, everyone else. You too. All right, take care. All right, take, take care, everybody.